Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Wherever you are around the world, we're glad you can spend some time with us. Thank you for joining us for the uh, 13th episode in the Global Webinar Series. As many of you know by now, my name is Daniel Quigley. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing here at DSI. We hope that you and your families and your colleagues and communities are all staying healthy and safe. Uh, we hope that the worst of 2020 is behind us and we're all looking forward to a much better uh, second half of the year. As always, our goal will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. Our team will be available to answer some questions directly via the chat, and if time allows, we'll have a Q&A following the presentation. Video of this presentation will be available online soon, and certificates will be emailed to, if, to you if you are listening to this live. You will be able to find a link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website at Google.com and clicking on the resources link in the top navigation bar and then click on webinars uh, and there you can see uh, past webinars and sign up for future webinars. Next week's webinar will feature two guest presenters and will focus on forming operations and hot stamping conditions. Last week we dedicated the webinar to frequently asked questions so you heard a lot from our team but it's always good to hear from a Gleeble user someone who is using Gleeble on a daily basis to conduct research and solve real world problems. So today we have a guest speaker. I'm happy to welcome Professor Damien Fabergé from Insel Lyon. Damien's presentation will focus on phase transformations in metallic alloys, as well as Gleeble case studies that he and his team have worked on. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Damien's presentation. I've had the good fortune of hearing several of his talks and I've always learned something new. Uh, in fact, I met Damien back in 2011 at a Gleeble user meeting in the Netherlands, and at the time I was relatively new to the Gleeble world and was still learning what the system can do, and his presentation really opened my eyes. He was using the Gleeble to run tests that I had never seen. He and his team had invented new tests and are always working on something new and groundbreaking. So I hope you enjoy his presentation as well. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Damien Fabergé. Damien, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, is it okay? Everyone can yes. hear me? I okay, can hear good. You. Good. Okay, so um, so um, welcome uh, everyone. Um, I'm very impressed because there is 181 participants right now, and I think it's a long time ago I didn't have um, that numbers of um, of people listening to me. I mean, I already got some some students for sure, as many students as this number, but usually most of them are sleepy, so uh, that's so. That's that's quite quite interesting, Dan. Um, so thank you for the principal nice presentation, Dan. So today um, I will try to give you um, a few examples, actually two case studies about phase transformation that we study uh, thanks to the Gleeble at Insadio. And I will try to show you um, that I think the Gleeble is a perfect tool for doing that type of things. Uh, I want to thank also Florian Mercier, who is also a participant today and is the one who is in charge of the Gleeble at INSA on the day-to-day -day basis. And uh, he, all the results are thanks to him, actually, and not thanks to FNP. Okay, um, so I will try to um, uh, I will try to show you. Okay, good. So I know traveling is not easy right now, but your first destination when all this crisis will be finished must be Lyon. Uh, so uh, if you want to come, uh, yeah, there's a few pictures of Lyon here. There's a city of history, of gastronomy, French gastronomy, a uh, city of technology, a city of culture. So you're more than welcome to, uh, to come and see us. Uh, I hope we will have some opportunities. I will maybe talk a little bit about that later. Um, by the way, uh, even if there is a lot of uh, things to see in Lyon, there's also a lot of things to do in Lyon, especially in research and innovations. Um, Lyon uh, is, was the first smart connected, connected city in France. It's a second digital cluster. There's a lot of labs with a lot of researchers. And uh, as you can see, there's many cluster and sector of excellence in Lyon. Um, and um, so you have a lot of students actually and uh, a lot of university and among it there is Insalion where I'm coming from. <clears throat> so uh, Insalion is an engineering school but it's a different one. It has been created in 1957 and uh, it has been created by a rector and a philosopher. That's pretty interesting and actually our value are humanism and diversity 
um, as you can see here, um, we are trying to uh, tackle some of the social challenges, um, looking at social and territorial diversity, academic diversity. Um, we are welcoming a lot of handicapped persons with individual solutions and equal opportunity for men and women. So that's really the DNA of our, of our institute. Now, um, this is some numbers. Uh, we have about 6,200 uh, engineering students. 34% uh, are, are female, which is a pretty nice numbers, especially in France. 28% uh, are internationals and 31% are this year. So uh, this is just to give you um, <clears throat> an idea about uh, what are the real values and numbers about INSA. Uh, now, definitely, uh, this is the largest engineering school in France. It's a highly selective student admission system. So, for example, last year we got 17,000 uh, files for only 600 uh, seats. Um, and we are have a strong links with industry. Definitely, you will see that in my case studies, which are all linked to the industry. And we have international uh, intensive international exchange. Actually, I'm vice president for international relationship. And all our students have to go abroad at least for one semester. And clearly, this is a school which is dedicated to research and innovations, as you can see by our rank. Among INSA, there's a lot of different labs. Uh, the one I belong to is Matelis, so it's one of the largest ones. Uh, there's about uh, 60 lecturers and about 60 PhD. And um, OK, you can see that number, about 100 papers a year. Um, so a lot of invited conference. We are dealing with all class of materials, metals, ceramic, and polymers. Even if today I will concentrate on metals because I'm part of, I'm part of the metal group. However, you will see at the end of my presentation that sometimes we are trying something different as Dan already introduced. Uh, the lab has a global approach, uh, trying to go from processing to use behavior. And uh, if you look at the approach we have, so we are going from the design uh, to the processing methods and then microstructural evaluation and then mechanical evaluation, I mean performance evaluations. And we are trying to couple all these type of experiments with a multi-scale and multi-physics modeling approach. So definitely the global is, um, is uh, mainly, actually uh, you can see the global at different points one on advanced processing methods and one on performance evaluations, but we also use the global on the design approach. I will talk just a, a little words about that um, later. Uh, just to give you a, a, few, a, a few things about the lab, I, I, I will concentrate on the global later, but I will just talk about two other things that we are, uh, that we are very interested in. So the first one is about the advanced processing methods. As I said, the global is part of this, uh, of this, but we are also using a lot the spark plasma sintering. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, sintering uh, thanks to uh, also Joule effect. So we have a machine installed in, the, in 2008, actually at the same time the global machine, you will see. Uh, we have a lot of publication on that. And just to give you an example about what we can do with this, um, so um, on the right hand side, you have the transparent ceramics. Um, you can go to polyethylene. I will talk about that later. And here, this is uh, nano iron that uh, we have done uh, thanks to the hospitals. Why I'm talking about spark plasma sintering is because this is a, as it's a, as it is a stem its point. Actually, it's a it's a method we are which are using the, <clears throat> the current in order to sinter. And it's quite close to a global machine. And so I will give you one or two examples about some of the same studies that we have done uh, in the global machines comparing with the uh, Spark Plasma Sintering machine. Hey, Damien, this is yeah. Dan. Your audio seems to be kind of coming in and out a little bit. I'm not sure if uh, you okay. have a, a microphone there that you can you put closer okay. to you. Thanks. Although if you're speaking now, we can't hear you.
Jamie, and I assume you're adjusting your audio. We'll give you a moment. Okay, we can see you. Okay. There we go. Thank you. I'm, I'm here again. I don't Very know. Good. I think I tried to put the computer closer to me for the sound, but it's, I don't know what happened, by the way. Is it okay? It's much better, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, so you can see my screen again? Yes. Yeah? Good. Okay, good. Yeah, so I was talking about the different materials that you can see here. For example, we are looking at architecture materials, multi-layers or um, porous materials that we, are, we, that we are making thanks to the SPS machine. Um, by the way, so let's go to the presentation. Another um, another type of things that we are that we are doing at Matei's lab is about uh, DCT diffraction contrast tomography. So you can see here. So it's a kind of EBSD in 3D. Uh, we are doing that at the, we are doing that at the synchrotron, and uh, at the same time, so you can image grains and, for example, a crack propagating during, for example, a tensile test or a fatigue test. And, and then we, as I said at the beginning, we are coupling that with some uh, modeling approach here. This is crystal plasticity approach and trying to uh, predict the behavior of the materials in 3D and uh, the reorientation of every grain. By the way, so that was a very, let's say, short presentation of the lab. Now, why I'm here today, I guess, uh, as Dan said, we met in a, one of a global meeting, but actually one was, uh, and here in, in Lyon at INSA a long time ago, 2013, it was a, a global welding group workshop, um, and uh, that's part of the uh, of the of the story. So the global machine at Matisse is uh, has been has been built in 2008, and uh, so I've been installed at the same year. So this is uh, all the characteristics that, that we have on the machines, and then we upgrade the system to a 3,800 in September 2017, and we got the max train modules. I will go back. The case, the case study number two is about the max train modules at the end of my presentations. So this is some, some picture, and I hope you will have uh, some chance to come to INSA and um, to work with us or to have some meeting here, uh, and you can see the global in the world. By the way, um, what about my personal life with Glebel? So I consider Glebel as uh, kind of my second wife, to be honest, because my first experience is uh, 20 years ago. Um, actually, it was not at Insight, it was at UBC in Canada, and I was working on precipitation in aluminum alloys. And then during my PhD, I managed to go back to UBC, and we have carried out some uh, tensile tests in the semi-solid state in aluminum alloys, which was kind of a challenge, as you may imagine, for the people who have already tried semi-solid tests in the global machine. So this is a kind of the curve that you get. So the strain is, as a function of strain, you can see this is a very small stress, by the way. And then we will measure, we were able to measure the maximum stress as a function of the solid fractions, uh, where we were doing uh, the test. Actually, it was a isothermal tensile test in the global. That was the beginning of my of my story with the Glebel, <clears throat> and then I got a chance that uh, in 2008 we uh, I have my own Glebel. It's not really my own Glebel, but that's uh, that was my my favorite tool for a lot of years. <clears throat> we have a lot of fun. Um, the first thing that we have done is that uh, we reproduce the heat affected zone in steel for looking at at welding. Um, then we have looked at mechanical properties at high temperature and high strain rate especially on cobalt-based alloys <clears throat> with Toku University. We developed some liquid metal embrittlement tests. So um, we put some liquid zinc inside the Glebel and we did some tensile tests, as you can see here. According to the temperature, you may or not have some liquid metal embrittlement. And we did a lot of sintering uh, and elaboration of architecture materials. So here in this example, this is a crumple aluminum force that we put in the Glebel and the current is uh, welding some bridges between the between between the folds and then as you can see on the on the downside on the right when you use the Glebel then the, your materials has different mechanical behavior 
So uh, we, we have done a lot of this type of test. Now, um, as in some part of the world, you have more chance than the other ones. Um, in UBC, they got the LUMET, so um, laser ultrasonic. I guess you may have already a presentation about that in this type of seminars. And so uh, I've been working with these guys to look at in situ recursization and grand growth in cobalt based super alloys. So you can see here some images and some curves that we were able to plot according to the time and according to temperature, the evolution of grain size in this type of alloys. And to be honest, it's a, un it's a unique tool to, to do so such things like that. Uh, that means uh, if you don't do that, you need to uh, quench your samples and then prepare your surface and look at that at the microscopes. Um, so um, so it's, it's a very, very convenient and powerful tool to look at that type of things. Okay, let's move on the real case studies of today. So I will try to present uh, you uh, two type of studies, the one on the global machine, like the usual one, the pocket jaw ones, and another one with the max strain modules. So the first case study uh, was one of my one of my PhD students. Um, it's the development of a new high strength steel. So it's in a framework in a European project. It's called Nanoform. So when I put the grant number here, the idea was to develop an old world benetic steel. And at the same time, we want a very high strength, higher than 800 MPa, but also a, a good all expansion result, that means higher than 60%. So uh, for the people who doesn't know the all expansion test, it's a way to measure, let's say, the formability of, of an alloy by putting a, a circular hole and then you extrude that hole, let's say, and you're looking at when does the first crack appear. So we, we tried a lot of different compositions and we end up with additions of titanium, niobium and molybdenum. And I will come back for, for the reason of that afterwards. Another thing, it, it should be cost affordable. That means um, not like very strange alloying elements uh, and very expensive one. And we also have not only to design the composition, which is not our, uh, the, the topic of today, but we had to design all the thermomechanical routes in terms of time, temperature, strain, uh, in order to have the final product that works. In that, uh, in that case study, um, I will show you that we were able to go from the lab scale to the industrial scale, and that the Gleeble was the only thing that permits us to first optimize the parameters at the lab scales and to end up with quite nice results at industrial scale. So that's a composition of the steel we end up with. So for the people who are familiar with this type of, of guys, so we use titanium and niobium for precipitations, but also to control grain growth. However, we need to know at what um, step of a, of a thermomechanical route we need precipitations. We use molybdenum in order to get bernite. And the first thing that we had to make uh, homogenization, uh, the first one after the elaboration was to our uh, 1200 degrees C and homogenization, and then it was the old world. We did some experiments on the Gleeber, some on, an avert, on, a, on a dilatometer, just because we had a lot of different steels. So uh, we just share between two labs. Okay, so just to give you um, an example, so um, so that's that's a typical route that we wanted to use. So after the slabs are, are obtained, then we have to the reaching stage, then the rough rolling, then the finishing rolling, and then the cooling down. So I will go through uh, three of these steps. So the first one, the air reaching ones, and then we will go and see finishing rolling and the run out. So reheating furnace, why it's really important? Because we have to choose the reheating temperature after hot rolling. Um, we want to dissolve all the precipitates that were formed during the elaboration of the steels, but definitely we don't want a very large grain size. So first things that uh, was to try different heat treatments, at so different temperature for a heating rate of five degrees C per second, 10 minutes holding and then a control cooling. And this eating rate and this holding time are, let's say, the parameters that are fixed because it's linked to the industrial um, applications. 
And then we did some thermal etching for getting the austenite grain size, because at the end of the day, definitely you don't have austenite. Um, so you may have perlite, ferrite, or whatever. And we did some TN for studying the precipitation state. So this is kind of uh, um, different results of a thermal etching that you can see here. <clears throat> But um, then we end up with this. So we were able to plot the grain diameter as a function of the temperature. And uh, we were looking at different types of precipitates. So uh, titanium nitride, TF4, C2, S2 populations. And, that, and the one that was very interesting is the titanium nitride uh, carbides populations, because it's the one that is responsible for uh, the hardening of, 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 of our environments. So, we add the grain diameter as a function of temperature. As I said, we want not to get a very large diameter, but at the same time, we need to dissolve all the precipitates in order to get a lot of solute elements in solid solution to induce precipitation at the end of the, of the, of the process. So then uh, we did some, um, some more experiments and we did some calculations and we proposed a model in order to look at uh, the volume fraction of precipitate as a function of temperature. So here, this is the titanium niobium carbides. As you can see here, you may predict uh, the evolution according to temperature and time. So the first one is according to temperature, and the second one as a function of time for a given temperature. Uh, you can see here that if you don't want to get any titanium titanium niobium carbides anymore, you should go at least at a at 1,250 degrees C. And in that case, <clears throat> with a reasonable time, you may have dissolved all your precipitate. So this is exactly that we, that we choose. Um, however, uh, so this is the, the experimental data for the grain diameter with temperature I already gave you. And we were able also to add a, a grain size model that uh, permits to calculate the evolution of this grain size as a function of temperature. So this is two different models according to the peeling pressure of the precipitates. Uh, by the way, it's giving you kind of similar results. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is one of the things that uh, it's kind of bad news, but uh, if you want to dissolve over precipitate, you should go out to 1,250 degrees. But at this temperature, you have a large increase of the grain diameter, about 400 microns in that case. So that means we need to find a way in the next steps to uh, refine the grain size. And that will be one of the key issues, as you will see. So let's go now. Uh, we are going to the finishing rolling. And the idea with the Glebel was to be able to characterize the recrystallization and precipitation kinetics during these finishing steps in order to get the right mechanical properties. So for doing that, we did some odd compressions and then stress relaxation tests to reproduce the finishing. So first we did the reheating that we just designed just before, 1,250 degrees for 10 minutes. Then we decreased the temperature uh, to the compression temperature. We did the compression um, with a 30 seconds starting before, and then we are doing uh, just stress relaxation. In that case, you may end up with three different types of uh, stress of stress according to time uh, curves. So the first one in red is where you have when you have recrystallization. In that case, at the beginning you have a linear part, and then you have let's say uh, the kind of usual kinetics uh, one G max once uh, during the recrystallization, and then again a linear part. Now you may have only recovery. In that case, you will end up with, uh, let's say, quite linear curves according to the logarithm of the time. And at the same time, you may have some precipitation events. In that case, uh, you can see that you have a linear part, and then you can see that the stress is decreasing um, slow, slowly, and then once again, a linear part. So you have these three types of behavior, and the idea is to be able to see what are the conditions, thanks to the people for which you will have recrystallization, recovery, recovery, and precipitations. Once again, if we want to have this type of mechanical properties that we wanted to have, we need to have some precipitations. Okay, 
so that's uh, that's not theoretical anymore. That's the experimental paths obtained with the people. As you can see here, this is a thousand degree, fifty degree, uh, a thousand fifty degree C, uh, with a deformation of uh, thirty percent and a strain rate of one uh, zero point one second seconds. You can see the recovery part. You have recrystallization, and then you have recovery and grain growth. Now, for the same strain and strain rate, if you decrease the temperature, you don't have recrystallization anymore because you don't have enough driving force. But you have recovery, and then you have precipitation that starts after about, let's say, 15 seconds, and then it ends up at about 80 seconds. So for high temperature and high strain, you can have recrystallization, but when you uh, decrease the driving force, then only recovery is possible, and sometimes it's coupled with precipitations. Once again, we need to have recrystallization and we need to have precipitation for getting the right uh, mechanical properties. So we did a lot of experiments varying strain, strain rate, temperature, and then you end up with diagrams, recrystallization, precipitation time diagrams that I can give you here. So here, this is for 10% deformations. Um, if you got that, you don't have any uh, enough driving force in order to induce recrystallization of oscillators. So in that case, uh, you can see that you will have only um, precipitation of titanium niobium carbides when the temperature is low enough. So at about, let's say it begins at about a thousand degrees C. And here you have the kinetics of the precipitation. That means at a thousand degrees C, the precipitation starts in about 10 seconds and finish in about 70 seconds. If you go at higher temperature, you don't have any precipitation because then in that case, it's too high and the solubility limit of niobium and, and titanium is higher in, in the austenite, so you don't have any precipitations anymore. If you go down, then uh, you will slow down the kinetics of precipitations. Now, if you increase the strain, you increase the driving force to get recrystallization, and in that case, you may have, according to temperature, different type of uh, metallurgical phenomena that appears. At high temperature, you will have recrystallization uh, with different kinetics. The higher the temperature, definitely the uh, faster is the kinetics of recrystallization of austenite. And you have precipitation of titanium niobium carbides at lower temperature, almost exactly the same as. Uh, um, as with, as with a low strain, because there is no real strain effect on these precipitations. And here you can see that we already have done some experiments with different strain rates, um, just because sometimes it's quite difficult to know what is what will is exactly the strain rate in the industrial conditions. And you can see there is an effect of the strain rate. When you increase the strain rate, you increase the driving force for the proxytization of austenite. So here, as you can see, uh, Thanks to that type of experiment with the Gleeble, it's really, really uh, nice and easy to know exactly what you should do as your processing parameters at, in the real life. Now, uh, let's move uh, to the next step of uh, thermomechanical routes, which is a cooling down. So we need to have a look at the influence of the cooling rate on phase transformation. So we have done this type of experiments that you have all done with the Gleeble, I guess. You just vary the cooling rate, and then you have to look at the, at the, at the microstructure. As you can see here, for example, I can show you that uh, when you increase the cooling rate, and you will go from ferrite and granular benite to a left light, left light benite, or even martensite, which is makes sense, and you have an increase of the hardness, as you can imagine. This is kind of a classical, but here you can see that you may have uh, benite already with a very low cooling rate, which is very interesting. Now we already we also have done some experiments about the influence of yosinite deformation on space transformation during cooling. So we have done some experiments, experiments for which you are making some compression tests and then you're going down and looking at the influence of the deformation of austenite on that type of uh, phase transformations. And you can see here that if you apply that, <clears throat> uh, then you will go, uh, let's say, it's, you have an effect on the on the type of microstructure with left like benite, which appears 
for, uh, let's say, slower cooling rates. So it helps if you want to have a less light period. Once again, uh, this is clearly a very nice way of doing the things because in only, uh, let's say, five samples, you have a clear view about what will happen in your processing, bar, in your processing uh, of your steel. So if you make the summary, um, thanks to the global, we're able to, to know what was the irritating temperature. We need to have a large change in the finishing step, step to promote rocasization. You need to have a high temperature at the beginning of the finishing stage to promote rocasization and a low temperature if you want to have precipitations. And then you need a sufficient cooling rate to get many benign. Now it's time to go to a, another scale. So we did some pilot plan trials on the 100 kilograms ingots, and uh, we try to get two different, let's say, two different routes. When for which the finishing stage was always at a temperature above the, the rocketization temperature, and one for which uh, some finishing step were above and some were below. So that's called uh, this one. RCR for rocketization control rolling, and this one for thermomechanical control process for which you have some finishing stage above and some finishing stage below. And then we have two different coiling uh, temperature. Um, this is the microstructure that you can get. So you can see that uh, when you have a low coiling temperature, you have more laugh benites. So in that case here, this is laugh benite mainly, where uh, if you have a high coiling rate, then you have granular benites. And now if you have a, um, if you are able to get some finishing stage at a temperature above and below the rocketization temperature, you have refinement of benite. If you remember at the beginning, we were, uh, we had to use a very high reheating temperature in order to dissolve all the precipitates. However, we got a very large grain size. So, uh, having this type of route for which a finishing stage is at the same time below and above the rocketization temperature permits to refine the bainite even if the um, austenite grain size is large at the beginning. So that was the best process. Um, and you can see that on the results. The best compromise here was definitely for low coiling temperature and uh, process for which you have some finishing stage on the two sides of a rocketization temperature. So we were almost there because we say that the beginning that the maximum stress should be higher than 800 and about 60% uh, all extension. It's not exactly the case for all extensions, but don't worry, we will end up with the right things because then we went to the industrial production trials. So here that was a six ton trials. Um, we got about the same microstructure almost, but not exactly because when you increase the size of your specimens and cooling rate are different, everything is a little bit different. And if you and if you measure the mechanical properties, that's very interesting, is that they are higher than at the industrial, at the small scale one. And as you can see here, uh, we got the right mechanical properties that we wanted to get at right at the beginning of, of, of our project. So now the steel is, is, is developed and is produced. Okay, so that was for the first case study. Now the second one, uh, I will show you some results that it's, it will be much less developed than the first one about the max train module. So maybe people don't know about the max train. I put a video, I hope it will work. Let's try, I hope you can see that. So you have your samples here and you can see you have a double compression at high temperature and at, after each pass, you just turn your samples by 90 degrees. So that's why it's called max strain because you may end up with a very large deformations. Actually, infinite deformation is supposed to be uh, possible. So um, the first thing that we have done, and just for fun, was to use that on aluminum alloys. So it's a 6,000 series. We, we have done that at a low temperature. We got 40 passes. So that means 40 times we got the double compressions with 0 0.2 for each pass. As you can imagine, that's a very large strain at the end of the day. And if you look at the curves here, 
you can see that you have a decrease of the maximum stress every time. So that means you may have some recrystallization that happens, and we will see that in detail. So that's about the microstructure. So here, um, you know, so this is, uh, let's say, your sample, which is represented here. You have a non-deformed uh, microstructure here. And here, this is where you've got the double compressions. As you can see, you have very elongated grains and smaller grains than before, which is confirmed if you measure the hardness. So you have a decrease of the hardness. Uh, you have a you have a decrease of the hardness if you go from the deformed, uh, the deformed part of the samples to the undeformed zones. So uh, you have at the same time com combination of strain hardening and recovery because the, the curve said you have some recrystallization, but the hardness said you have hardened your material. So at the same time, you have competition between strain hardening and recovery. So in order to look at that, you should look at EBSD. So that's uh, that's the, the, some of the picture that you got here. As you can see, there is an auto heterogeneous deformations and an heterogeneous recovery. In some grains, you have recovery that appear, and some of them you don't have any recovery yet. You can see there's a lot of dislocation inside, by the way. Um, so I will come back later on that, but max train may be used for having at the same time in the same samples, uh, let's say different thermomechanical routes. I would explain that later. In some of the parts of the, your samples, you have a fully recrystallized grain, as you can see, the blue ones. This is a kind of average visualization map on the, on the right uh, low hand side. So the blue is almost without dislocation, the red is with a lot of dislocation. You can see that you have a fully recrystallized grain, and some of them are and uh, still very deformed. Now, the most interesting part was to look at, um, at the zone in your samples uh, um, between where it's deformed and undeformed. Because as you can see, when you have these double compressions, uh, the boundary between form, deformed and, and undeformed uh, uh, parts, you will have a very large trend here a very large shear strain. So you can see that here because the boundary, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the boundary is quite here. So when you go from red grains to let's say blue grains, and if you look at kernel average misorientation map, you can see that at the boundary between the deformed and undeformed, <clears throat> you have a very high density of dislocation, especially at grain boundaries. Now, if you make a zoom, you will observe that. And I guess for some people who know a little bit uh, about steel, it should uh, remember you some of the things. This is kind of twins like structure. And you can see here that in aluminum alloys, which are not really famous uh, for making twins, I mean, you can do some twins, but it's really rare and very specific uh, conditions. In that case, with this very high deformation that you will apply, um, you may have some, let's say, twin-like structure. So here, this is a rotation of around 30%, 30 degree of initial grains, and as you're going from a 110 to a 111 orientations, as you can see here on that sheet. So that was the first results. Here, as you can see, it was just for fun. That means, okay, putting one samples inside and see what the max train can do. However, once again, the idea was to be able to reproduce some process, a real process, in order to optimize the parameters. So um, <clears throat> this is the this is the second part. Uh, here we are talking about long products, large diameters made of ferritic stainless steels. I won't give you a lot of details. I'm not allowed to do that, but at least you know it's ferritic stainless steel, and it's a hot rolling process. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of different steps. The temperature is decreasing during the process. And so you can imagine that the strain, the accumulated strain is increased, but the temperature is decreasing during the process. Um, and so this is a very complex thermomechanical cycles uh, with recrystallizations inside that should, that should happen inside. And um, as you can imagine, there there is no way to reproduce that process in a real life. 
I mean, up to now, all these guys, they were making some torsion tests, but even in torsion, they got a lot of troubles because uh, first, you need to have a very large deformations and usually at a while the, rota the torsion is not working anymore. And then torsion means um, heterogeneous strain and heter heterogeneous strain rate. And the second problem in that case uh, is this one. I will go back to the, to the last slide afterwards, is that the blooms are heterogeneous by nature. So you can see that you have some basaltic grains on the outside and you have some equiax grain inside. So now if you make some torsion test inside, then not only you have the heterogeneous strain and strain rate, but heterogeneous microstructure. No, I'm going back. You can see this is a quite difficult uh, kind of, uh, of thermomechanical cycles. So this is accumulated strain. I didn't give the, the scale here, but let's say that it's a few here. That means between, let's say, two and 10 in terms of strain, and that's the number of pass. So the number of, of hot fall. Um, so that's the experimental one the, in green. And we, we try to make the kind of the same process with the max strain. So, um, so uh, this is a modeling uh, that, that gives you that. And we use the data of, of the experiments as the modeling was not able to uh, clearly reproduce that things. So we managed to do exactly these cycles, but we did that on two types of samples, one which has been taken in the outside layer of the bloom and one in the inside layer of the bloom. And then we have a look at the influence of the microstructure. On, uh, the, on the initial microstructure, on the final microstructure with the right thermomechanical cycle. So that's uh, some results. So uh, this is uh, uh, on samples which has been taken at the surface and one on the core. And you can see the huge influence of the initial structure of the bloom. So that means now if you are doing your uh, real process um, on the bloom, you will end up with la very large ferritic grain on the surface and smaller grain on the core, which is not the one the thing that you want for your application. So you need to get, let's say, the, high, the more homogeneous structure you, you, you can. So first, it explains the thing that has already been demonstrated, but here in samples, which has the same microstructure everywhere. Now, the idea is, can we get the same microstructure on the both sides? So here that we tried, we tried to change the composition of this ferritic stainless steel in order to get some austenite during the hot rolling. As you can see here, so that's a classical one with only full ferrite microstructure at the beginning. And this one, we introduced some austenite during the process. This austenite will permit to decrease the grain size and to get very equiax weight. So when you've got austenite, you will have recovery and recrystallizations, and you have smaller grain size. So that's one, that's one way, let's say, to be able to get equiax grains wherever you want. However, you have to change your composition. That means you have to change the price and everything. Now, we managed to do something else that is not possible, now let's, let's say not easy to do in the real process, is that we change the first temperature. I mean, the initial temperature for which you begin to roll your samples. As once, one again, this is only strain according to number of pass, but you have to imagine that during this process, the temperature is decreasing at the same time. In the real process, but also in the max strain. In the max strain, we are able to change the temperature whenever we want. So we were able to reproduce another type of process for which we change the, mm, the initial temperature. As you can see here, uh, when you have a high temperature, you have more recrystallization, which makes sense. Uh, then you've got a fully recrystallized state and you can change now the grain size. So the good thing about this study is that now this guy, they know exactly what they have to do on their process in order to get 
at the end of the day, uh, let's say a more homogeneous structure, even if they don't change the compositions, by changing the temperature, the initial ones, if they don't want to change the composition. And one, once again, this, this is the only way to do it. I mean, I don't think there is another experimental device that would permit to do that. Okay, so I'm going to my final conclusion here because I guess it's almost time. Um, so on the first part, I tried to show you the development of new steels. Um, so I think, and this is my really way of thinking, the Gable is, is at the same time the perfect tool to carry out deep scientific studies about phase transformation, precipitation, recursization, but also to optimize a real process. And, uh, and that's quite unique because you are able to mimic the process in a very nice way. And here I show you that during these examples that we went to the scale transition and it works quite well. So, I mean, the thing that we have done in the lab, you can use it directly for your, for your industrial process. Now about the max plane, um, we have some silver plastic deformation on large samples. I didn't say that, but you show that maybe on the, you see that on the video that you are able to make a tensile test after one. So this is quite the only way almost of looking at several plastic deformation with samples which are large enough and homogeneous enough, enough to, um, to measure the real mechanical properties. And this is also a unique tool for the simulation of very complex thermomechanical cycles. I show you one example about long products. And it's possible thanks to that type of experiments that you may optimize the process parameters and develop new grades. As you have seen, we change the compositions and we observe that in that case, the sample should be, uh, should be homogeneous whatever you're looking at the surface of the core of your parts. So all these results have been done in different projects. I want to make some special thanks to some of my colleagues that are seated here. I just want to go for a few outlooks. <clears throat> I, I talked to you at, at the beginning that I, I'm in the metal group, so I'm mainly working on metals. I talked to you that um, we, are, we have done a lot of sintering inside. This is uh, one device that we developed at ITSA, and it was for sintering a polymer and uh, a non-conductive one. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that it's a kind of um, compression device that we put the polymer powder inside and we center it. Uh, why we did that? I think this is maybe the most interesting one. Um, if you look at the, at the graph here, uh, you can see the evolution of the pressure and temperature. And you can see that actually uh, here, um, we center at about 200 degrees C from one to 15 minutes. This one is an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Maybe you know guys about this, but uh, it's a very difficult uh, polymer to get. Um, and if you want to center that in a, let's say, classical way, it's about 300 degrees C for 24 hours. Now, if you look at the results, this is the evolution of the stress as a function of strain. Maybe you know about uh, this type of polymer, that uh, this is exactly the mechanical properties that we get after the sintering in a classical way. So that means here that the Glibel is able to sinter your polymer getting the same mechanical answer that actually this means the same crystallinity uh, fraction, <clears throat> but I don't have time to go into the details, but in only about 15 minutes or a few minutes instead of 24 hours. So maybe we can talk about that later, why it's, it's working this way. There's a lot of different uh, uh, of different explanations that are possible. But uh, this is type of, of experiment you should try with your Glibel because the Glibel is uh, not just only the thing that DSI try to sell you. Um, it's not only that. Uh, so uh, you can do definitely what they said they can, you can do, but you can do much more. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you, guys. Damien, thank you, as, as always. Uh, something interesting and, and different, so appreciate that.
Uh, actually, I, I said all those nice things about you, and uh, thankfully you you didn't disappoint. I knew uh, knew you wouldn't. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions. If uh, you can stick around for a minute here, uh, one of the questions we had is: uh, Have you worked with ind industrial cast materials? And do you have any comments or tips about working with materials with very large grain sizes, uh, where there may be only a few grains across the global specimen? Mm. Okay, so it really depends on what you want to do. I mean, uh, it, it is the case, for example, with the lumet, because uh, with the lumet, if you have some, if you have a lot of grains, then it's kind of difficult to get uh, the right things. Um, now, if you have only a few grains inside, definitely that will be much more complicated to get, uh, let's say, uh, um, <clears throat> the right mechanical behavior. I never try to get only like uh, like 10 grains inside, to be honest. So, no, okay. I, I, I didn't have any tips for doing that. Okay, very good. Uh, you, in your, your first case study, you talked about bayonetic steel uh, and you mentioned hole expansion. Have you ever tried to do elevated temperature a whole expansion test in the Gleeble? No. Okay. No, no. No, the whole expansion test has not been done in the Gleeble, right? It's like, uh, it's um, it's a normalized one. So the size, it's kind of dictated by some things and it's a low temperature one. These Benetic teams are for uh, automotive applications. So it's called from. Okay. Very good. And we've got a bunch of questions coming in here uh, quickly now. So I will say if uh, our team can follow up uh, after the webinar uh, and address some of these questions, I don't think we're going to get to all of them here. Uh, and some of the comments are, are very nice here. Uh, this one uh, it says, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, they appreciate Dr. Fabergé addressing these issues. A couple of questions. Uh, what should the dimensions be of the hot compression specimen uh, in the global simulation to avoid uh, generating heterogeneous deformation. And it may be a bit uh, dependent on the type of test you're running, uh, but in terms of a deformation, uh, the hot compression specimen, uh, what do you recommend? Okay, so usually um, our specimens are the ones that are are given by, by, by DSI. So 15 by, wow, 15 length by what is uh, seven diameter, am I right, or 10 diameter? Yeah, they do vary. The, 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 the ratio is what's important to us. That's kind of in yeah. Our so the ratio is, is usually yeah. between one third and two thirds. By the way, this is a mechanical uh, law. Now, uh, clearly, clearly, the what it's what you have to be careful about is uh, definitely the contact between the grips. I mean the the angles and your samples. So we did a lot of different trials with Florian, and maybe Florian will be much more able to, for me to than me to to answer to that. But definitely um, having graphite and nickel paste help a lot to, uh, to avoid barreling. Um, now, in some case, uh, for certain materials, you have, to, you have to be very careful about the electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. You may end up with tantalum foils between your samples and, and the angles. Now, the, only, the other way, also the other things that you have to think about, is the materials of the angels. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have the tungsten carbides one, we have the pure tungsten ones, but in some case we have to design, to design special angels for different materials. Yeah, I know there's a lot of focus here on that as well, and, and that's something that people that are doing the uh, unix compression testing are, are always struggle with. The angels are something that is a, uh, obviously they need to be stronger than the material. And we, that, we broke a lot of uh, we broke a lot of tungsten carbides one, especially at high strain and high temperature when we were looking at cobalt-based super alloys. We did a, I didn't have the time to look at that, but we did a lot of uh, tests for having a process uh, range on cobalt-based super alloys with high strain up to 10 per seconds. I guess Julien is, is here, I think, in the participant. He's, he was one of my PhD who was working on that. And very high temperature. We broke a lot of tungsten carbides. So we bought the pure tungsten ones. It was a little bit better. Okay, very good. A couple, so the video you shared, I think it was slide 42. Do you mind jumping back to that? That's the Max Green video. Yeah. It was a little bit jumpy. I don't know if it was a bandwidth 
issue. Uh, but okay. maybe we can kind of describe what's happening there because I think you, you can't really in the video see the, the specimen rotating. And okay. Really, so maybe even just kind of play the video and, and kind of talk through what is happening here. Yeah. So, so I don't know what you see, but the sample is odd. Then you have, okay, gosh. Um, so then you have the double compressions, then the two envelopes are removed on this side, then the sample is turned by 90 degree, 90 degree, then you, again, you make a double compressions, you remove the envelopes, you turn by 90 degree, you do the double compressions, you remove the envelopes, you turn by 90 degree, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So how much actually this is a double compressions, and between every compressions you go, uh, for 90 degree where uh, you turn your samples by 90 degree. Great, thank you. Uh, so again, as I mentioned here, at the end of the presentation, we had a, a bunch of questions that did come in. We're not gonna be able to get to them, but I do want to uh, let people know that we will follow up. And if you do need to make a, a connection, Damien, we'll, we can hopefully do that. Uh, if people do have more sure. questions. Uh, we'll try to take a first crack at them. Some of the questions are kind of what the system can do. We can obviously answer those, but questions about your research, uh, we probably direct to you. Uh, so, Damien, thank you very much uh, for making this. You're already ready to come. Uh, it was great as always. Uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, fortunately, our time is, is about up here. Uh, if you have any technical questions about the operation of your Gleeble, please contact our service team. I mentioned this on every webinar. Uh, please do use the service portal. Uh, you can access that on our website uh, and go in for users. Can the current users can create an account. Uh, and then you can access a knowledge base, which is helpful, as well as create support tickets. You know, as I've mentioned in the past, our team can't travel right now uh, a whole lot based on uh, the pandemic, uh, but we are working on ways that we can support people remotely. So uh, I would definitely recommend if you have an issue with your machine or you have questions, create a support ticket, and that will get to the, the right person at DSI to help out. If you have any questions about how Gleeble can support your research, uh, please email me, and I'll connect you with, to an application expert I'll help you find the right solution. Uh, my email address is dan.quigley at gleeble.com. It should be in the uh, invite email as well. In a couple of hours, you will get an email that has uh, a link to download the presentation as well as a link, and it'll be available later today to view the a recording of this webinar. Again, Damien, thank you. I wanna thank everyone else for joining us as well. I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Have a great day.